What is up, Podheads? Back with another episode of the Podio Slate Podcast. My name is Tony, joined by Anthony. And uh, tonight, yo, yo, yo. We, we're Podio Slave most of the time, but tonight we're Podio Vent. Oh, I love that. Yep. Yep. <laughs> well, which is a better name. I know, right? We could have gone that route. Uh, maybe we changed the name. Maybe, who Jason, knows? Ben, if you're listening, <laughs> if you green light it, we're going to change it. We'll be potty event. Yeah. Or maybe we'll even be potty <laughs> event in the episode card for this week. Who knows? It hasn't happened yet. So that, that could totally happen. But yeah, potty event. That was a, that was a blast. That was a fun conversation. Yeah. No, we, uh, you'll hear it here in, you know, two or three minutes, but we've, uh, we've been fans since what? Oh, two, right. When the energy came yep. out. And I think that's, you know, for people on the East coast, that's when they got it. You know, they'd been a band for a decade before that, but the national coverage and exposure was, when the energy was released as a single, which we heard on WCYY. Yeah, shout out Rob, who he is part of our, our icebreaker, so we appreciate him. Wait, does Rob listen? Is he going to? Uh, yeah, he doesn't even listen to the episodes he's on, so yeah, whatever. <laughs> Rob is the, is the best. He's shouted us out on the radio a few times for free and had me on there, so yeah, no, we, we love Rob. Yeah, this week, Jason Boyd, vocalist, Ben uh, Einziger, guitarist of Audio Vent, and, um, I would say it went as good as it could have gone. Like the, the, those two guys, if you're listening, two of the nicest, most genuine guests I think we've had on this podcast. We've Absolutely. had a lot of great ones. I'm not going to discount that, but just you know, in terms of passion for music, you know, willing to you know be down to clown, down to chat, still have the you know, still have it, and you know, dig deep into the memory bank for, for stories. I mean, I'm in on that. I'm in on all that. Some of our favorite episodes are those, right? And and it's even better that they are still a band still making music today out of, you know, the last couple of years. They've gotten back together and, and tossed some songs out there. And, and go check those out if you haven't checked out. Uh, Sonic Sunrise came out a couple weeks back. Really, really good track. And hopefully more coming coming after. I think there was a new one last fall as well, uh, Sleepless Machine. But, yeah, check those songs out if you haven't. And uh, we just appreciate anybody that has uh, clicked on any of these episodes. So if you're here from the Eddie episode a few weeks back, talking about uh, 20 years of where you want to be, if you're here from Boston Manor last week, uh, Henry, that was an awesome, awesome conversation about their new record, which comes out later this week. Really thank you for, for giving us, you know, any time at all. And uh, this one is, is definitely one you'll, you'll enjoy as well. Yeah, you'll, you'll absolutely enjoy this. They're modest, they're humble, they're super talented. And um, it's really a gift. Like uh, guys like this that are still making music after all these years, it's a gift, and it's on their terms. You know, we we talk about that. There's 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 no label breathing down their necks for a, for a single. It's just you know creativity is boundless at this stage. Yeah, you want to get into it? Let's, yeah, get, let's into get into it. it. Jason and Ben of Audio Vent. Here we go. Jason and Ben from Audio Vent. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Good to be here. We, uh, we're excited to talk to you guys. You're a band that we've thought about off and on for the life of the podcast. We're probably four and a half years old now, and you've come up in conversation with friends. Uh, a friend of ours is a radio DJ in Portland, Maine, and I think, Ben, he told me he knew you. Do you remember Rob from CYY, WCYY? Yeah, actually, I, remember, I do remember, remember Rob. He remember those awesome. yeah, 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 yeah. Super, super nice. awesome. Yeah. He's uh, yeah. he's one of our best friends. He's been on with us probably ten times. He's still a radio jock awesome. in, in Portland. So he oh, was no like, way. "Oh, you get you're getting you're gonna talk to Ben." Like, I, tell him I said hi. So we're we're telling uh, him now. He says, "Oh, <laughs> yeah. tell him I said tell him I said play Sonic Sunrise." <laughs> yeah, right. Actually, I will yeah, tell him. We that. will. Yeah. 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 No, that's awesome. That's awesome. I remember we I think we did something for um, WCYY. We played a show, and I remember it was like unbelievably cold, but it was like. You would remember that. We were, I think we played, I think it was like a, it was, I think like OK Go played and then we played remember after them. Yes. It was oh. in some theater or something. I think it was, um, yes, it was a holiday bazaar in the yeah, winter. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. You got it, it. it was and, their annual party, basically. Right. And I remember my legs were cold. I never, I mean, I've grown up <laughs> in the snow and snowboarded and, and I've never walked outside and been like, my legs are literally shaking, you know? That's how cold it was. This this guy, thankfully, he has like the best memory of anyone I, I've ever known. 
because my memory is complete shit. I don't. I, I remember those call letters. I don't remember any anything being cold or anything like. I don't know. I'm just saying specific. But yeah, yeah. Maine, Maine does get cold, and they used to do that right around right around Christmas. So it would be yeah. mid mid December or so. So that that checks out. It definitely would have been cold yeah. then. Yeah. We 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 definitely <laughs> snow on the ground and all that all that stuff. Yeah. You probably played either played the State Theater or the Civic Center at the time. Was it the big room? Was it like eight thousand cap kind of that room? Uh, I think it was probably like maybe like three thousand. Yeah, it was the State Memory. Theater. Yeah, yeah, awesome little theater venue in in Portland that we still go to. Still, still yeah. has awesome shows. That's awesome. Well, you played the big room too. It was that big local bazooka tour, which was like I look at the lineup. I'm like, that's a traveling circus if I've ever seen one. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> that was a terrifying tour to be a part. It really of. was. <laughs> like really nice bands. Like I loved, I loved the the Seven Dust guys, the Non Point guys mm-hmm. were all really, really amazing. And the Matic Gravity guys were all really nice. Oh, yeah. It's just, um, like, our band, like, no one really kn- knew what to do with us, you know? Like, we weren't quite heavy enough to be on that tour without getting things thrown at us. Like, I think maybe that show was okay, but there were some shows, like, we went on right before Mushroom Head, and literally, like, as soon as... wild. And I don't know if that show, if the stages were side-by-side side or if it was just one band at a time that you're referring to, but, like, most of the shows were outdoors, and... And it would be like, you'd be side by side. So like, while we were playing, Mushroom Head would be getting set up and, you know, everybody wanted to see what the guys in the masks were going to look like. And I'm sure they had a lot of fans there. But there were a few shows where literally like 4,000 people would just leave <laughs> right in front of us yeah. and just be flipping us off from like 100 feet away. Just being like, wow. Dude. We thought we thought we had them for a few minutes yeah. too. Playing, but yeah. no, as soon as I saw them going on. I, I think that show, it might have been one where they had dueling stages and Mm -hmm. i've read online not about you guys but other festivals where if one party like one side doesn't like that band they'll just look the other way and wait for the other band while the current band's (laughs) yes yeah they just blare witch they just literally turn their head into the corner (laughs) yeah Yeah. they just uh yeah Yeah. we had some good shows there were some but like every time you kind of weren't sure if you were going to get your ass kicked you know like every every show that we played and like some shows there'd be like 5,000 people like jumping up and down and you know we play like the energy or gravity or something and like the whole place would just go nuts which was awesome so it was really bizarre that you go from town to town and some people just hated us yeah like hated us so much like it, it was uh it was character building to say the least oh I'm yeah. sure yeah it also made us uh feel like we were a heavier band yeah when we were on stage because we were all we were surrounded by these you know just it was like a metal tour yeah. basically and uh, so we sort of brought that, I don't know, we sort of brought a little bit of metal with us, but yeah. we didn't ever feel like we were fully, we weren't fully on the dark side. Yeah. You weren't wearing mushroom head masks, like backstage <laughs> and shit. Like, <laughs> I don't think we talked to any of those guys. I, yeah, I don't know if we ever did. I don't think, those, I, I don't think they, like, Seven Dust guys hung out a lot. Like, they were lovely. They were awesome. Like, non-point guys, we hung out with them all the time. I didn't really see the filter guys ever. Yeah, I didn't really ever see them either. And uh, Nomadic Gravity guys. I think those are the only bands we really like, hung out with on that tour. Yeah, we had Lejean on a couple summers ago. He is like one of the nicest guys ever. So that, that definitely awesome. checks out. Yeah, yeah. He's just uh, so down to earth, you know? Yeah. So those tours you're playing, like the, lo- the local bazooka in Portland, that was an 8,000 cap venue. Let's dial it back. First, so before you guys were audio vent, it was just vent. And at some point the name changed. But when I say... What was the first vent gig like? What comes to mind? Well, there's other names. We were before we were we'd gone through we've been like ten to ten yeah. names or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> we started out as, as afterlife. We started, started Tempest. 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 We started as Tempest. And then we were afterlife. And then we were after taste briefly and then we went back to afterlife. Yeah. And then the tourists. I, no, well, yeah, the tourists and then and then they went away on vacation and I was planning a show for us. <laughs> so I changed our name for the flyer to Ashkabad. I didn't know what it I just thought it was cool at the time. And then when he got back, they're like, what did you do? Yeah. Like, okay, we'll go back to the tourists. Yeah, kind of I mean, the problem was, is every name that we found, we would, we, you know, you didn't have the internet back then. So you'd be like, oh, we're, we're Afterlife. That's a cool name. That's weird. The Afterlife is, was kind of fun and creepy. And, and then you'd find out that, oh, this band 10 years ago that you discovered is called Afterlife. And yeah. the same thing with every name, even Vent, because we, we did Vent. We had some guy, it was really funny. We were playing a show at this venue that is no longer, it's like a, it's like a like a a dance club now. I think called like high height. I don't remember hide maybe. 
in Hollywood. He used to be called the Coconut oh, Teaser. Coconut Teaser. And there was a guy from a band that he said he was in Vent, and we were playing there. And we had like a pretty big fan base for like a local band. Like we would sell out. And I'll get to your question, by the way, which I know I'm taking. Oh long. no, this is great. great. This is what it's all about. This is the good stuff. Cool. So you know, we were able to to from all the local kids at our schools to like random schools to then people that we didn't know after playing, you know, a bunch of gigs with, you know, our friend's band, whether we were playing with, you know, the Hoobastank guys or or even with our brother's bands, like we would kind of start to build this fan base. It started with friends and then it became people we didn't know showing up at our shows to, to mostly people we didn't know at our shows. And I remember we played this sold out show at the Coconut Teaser and this guy waited for us, like he wanted to fight us or something. He just was, you could see he was so angry. And, <laughs> And he came over and he showed us, he's like, he's like, we're in the band vent. And he showed us a bank statement that he had a check. No account. way. Wow. He was ready. He came prepared. Oh, yeah. I don't remember this at all. I'm so <laughs> and, happy to remember and this. It was, and it was receipts. so wild. But then when we, when we signed to <laughs> records, they were like, there's like 17 other bands called vent mm -hmm. around the world. So we started looking at a bunch of different names. We tried to go after, I mean, there were a lot of names. Like we were like Sabretooth, maybe, I don't know. That was one name that we had thought about. Yeah. And then Matterhorn. Like the ride at Disneyland, we were like, "That's fucking cool." Matterhorn is a souvenirs. Game. Yeah, souvenirs was yeah, another one. About it. But like Matterhorn, they did a check and they found out there was one other band called Matterhorn. So we were like, "I was," you know, how how that name actually came about is, I saw there was like a, a fan site called VentAudio.com, and I was like, oh, wow. huh, "That's interesting." What about Audio Vent? And we were like, "It worked." I didn't. We didn't. I don't know if we really thought it was better than Vent, but. We couldn't use Ven, and we were yeah. tired of trying to look for names. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. we just became audio Ven. Yeah. yeah. So I'll let you explain our first afterlife show because that was really like the first time. That what, it was like the same back, backyard people, show, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. It was so our first show ever. Yeah, our first show ever was basically. Uh, wait, was it the stage one or the bat or my backyard? It was a stage that we Yeah, played. so the stage one. That's the one that I actually changed our name to Ashkabat. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, and then we changed it back because <laughs> we got there. So my uh, 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 my dad helped helped us build a stage. He basically built it, but yeah. he helped us build a stage uh, for the for our front yard, so that my band, our, our band, uh, Incubus, and then oops, Mind uh, Mind Riot, Mind Riot, and then yeah, maybe one other band. It was going to be like a little, you know, like a little show in our front yard in the middle of a canyon, and we were inviting everyone. I passed out flyers everywhere, and like you know, all of the high school and everything. I think maybe like thirty people showed up. Yeah. And some of our older neighbors walked down and stuff, but it was awesome. It was, I remember it, uh, it being a lot of fun. The, uh, the one that sticks out the most about to me though, is the backyard show, um, where we, uh, it was my 14th birthday and, uh, I had started the band with Paul and our old drummer, Greg, and my friend Shane at first after my 13th birthday. So a year earlier. And, uh, and then we got banned in what, like a couple weeks later yeah. or something like that, basically. So. But that show was just awesome. I had my first kiss that night, too. It was just like, it was an epic, just, we played. I felt like, I felt like the best I'd ever felt at that time. I felt like, oh, my God. And we were doing, I was doing mainly, like, spoken word poetry over yeah. metal riffs. Like, that's what we were doing at the time. It's, it's awesome. At a certain point, I'm sure we'll release some of that older, older stuff. It's pretty awesome. Some There's the, nothing cooler than watching people, like, mosh to your song when you're 14. Mm -hmm. or, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. I don't know how our parents let us get away with that, because there should have been some... Like there could have been some lawsuits. Yeah, we didn't have a guy <laughs> yeah. backyard. There was brick walls and stuff, and these kids were going nuts. Yeah, so that's awesome. That's so good. I was gonna say, yeah, you were 13, 13, 14, so middle school, high school ish, almost, yeah. right? Yeah, I think you you had just gotten to high school, and I was in eighth grade. Uh -huh. maybe, so. Yeah, that's crazy. So what what made you guys want to like start it? Was it just you just had the itch to play music and get together and mosh in your front yard. I played um I played piano and like I came from a really musical family also just as Jason did too and played a bit of piano and then as I got older I just all of the influences I was listening to were like metal you know I was just I was listening to a lot of Metallica and Pantera you know Slayer and Megadeth like I was like and I and I was like let me try to learn this stuff on piano it just sounded like ridiculous of oh, course nice. so, I like that so, <laughs> So I was like, let me get a guitar. And I, I took like a few lessons. I didn't really know how to play, but I just loved it so much. So, and, and it just turned out that like after two weeks of me playing guitar, uh, my stepbrother Paul, who plays <laughs> bass in the audio event, was like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in a band with Jason. And, uh, and I was like, well, can I join the band? Like, I want to yeah. play. And I, I literally could play like, like a couple 
little basic Metallica riffs, you know, like, so, so I kind of learned how to play in, like in the band of, I guess what became audio event. And I think like one of the things that was really inspiring was I remember I was in seventh grade at our junior high school and this band played like, they just, they played like our eighth grade dance or whatever. And we were in, you were in six, I was in seventh. And I don't know if you were there or not, but they, they covered like sweet child of mine. And I was just like, I couldn't believe the magic and power that I saw and felt in that moment. And that was like, I don't know, it was super eye opening. And then I remember like, you know, cause my brother obviously is a really, really amazing guitar player. And I remember when he was going over to your house to play with Jason's mm-hmm. brother, Brandon, and they were doing Incubus and I would go up there and I kind of sit in their, their rehearsal for a second, like on listening to the basic things that they were doing. And I was like, well, that is so cool. Like, I just thought it was like, four people in a room coming together and just adding these little ingredients and making the sound I just thought was really inspiring. So when it came to Paul talking to Jason and Jason being like, Hey, Paul, you want to be in the band? I was like, I knew Jason like from afar. Like we had one moment where we like, I played basketball. Yeah. We played basketball. kicked my ass on that, unfortunately. Yeah. I I love basketball. (laughs) I I used to pride myself on like the fact that I was, I was pretty good. I was taller than everyone and everything. And yeah, but I played Ben and it just pissed me off. So, <laughs> so that was like our only like real like interaction. I don't even know if when I went to your house to see like my brother play, I don't, I don't even know I don't if we hung out. out. Yeah, I don't remember. That. So, uh, but yeah, then we, I went to Jason's house. We were in the garage. We wrote two songs in like our first like week of playing and it was just fun. You know, like yeah. we just, I think we had that itch that was like, that's all we wanted to do is keep going back in the room and being excited to make noise and, like, I guess, orchestrated noise. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. You can't match that excitement that age. Like I, I remember, I think it was eighth grade buddy of mine got an acoustic guitar. He's trying to figure it out. So then I go buy a bass and then we find out a buddy's dad has a drum set and the excitement, it, it was like Christmas, like the next day, you know, just trying to figure out finding tabs. This was, you know, the internet was a, th- a thing at this point in time, but yeah. Yeah. yeah I like, I've, I've chased that high for 25 years. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard to keep that sort of childlike excitement about it, you know, yeah. without, without letting all the sort of exterior, exterior walls that you've built up get in the way of the fun of it, you know, yeah, and, well, I mean, it's writer's like block, you know? Exactly, yeah. 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 When did you guys start to like, take it seriously? Like, oh, we've got something here. Like, let's, let's start putting stuff down. Let's start seeing if people come to shows and maybe send stuff to people and put a record out, that type of stuff. For me, I was taking it seriously from day one. So yeah. It was just like this. I mean, we, one of the reasons we got like a little bit of a, like a fan base while we were still in high school and stuff, and we were um, playing a lot of shows, we, we really took this seriously kind of from the beginning. And all we did was rehearse and write. Other kids were like, you know, going fucking off and going to parties and doing all that. We still went to some of those things, but we were more excited to like as much as we could. Let's get in the garage. Let's yeah. get in the garage and let's write and let's work and let's be as tight as possible. And uh, uh, and like unhealthy, dusty garage in absolutely. summertime where yeah. it's like 108 yeah. to 110 degrees yeah. outside. And we didn't care, you know, like we just we were we were just so thrilled and excited. And then we go, you know, pick up any cash that we could to like go make a quick, you know, two song demo or four song demo. And, you know, I think once we got, you know, we switched drummers, we ended up getting Jamin in the band. And Jamin was also just as serious about music as we mm-hmm. were. So I think that 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 just kind of fueled the fire for us to to want to you know excel and 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 continue bit building this thing. And as soon as we got our confidence with it yeah. too, that was really like that was the sort of ladder we were climbing up on. Basically, it was like we can do this. Yeah, and uh, it it definitely helped to have brothers who were doing it too because yeah. seeing the fact that it was working for them was just making it like was reinforcing the fact that oh shit this can work, like we can do this you know and. Yeah, like all the, I don't know, I, I grew up singing in, in the, basically putting the camera on and just pretending I was other singers growing up, you know, doing that kind of thing. So I always wanted to do it, but sometimes it helps when people who have no experience with something, they've never done it before, see someone else like, oh my God, wait, that's possible, yeah. you know? So, yeah. So yeah, there was, a, there was a bit of a blueprint, you know, so this, these are things that are good to do, or these are mm-hmm. things that you shouldn't do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I remember for me, it's like when it, when it seemed more, I guess the word serious or more, when we took it more professional from that perspective was when 
I started not recognizing people at our show, like other than people, like yeah, you being like, oh, they, like yeah. our friends weren't the ones that were filling up the space. Now, now it was like people coming and singing lyrics to these demos that we wrote, you know, and and, That's and requesting yeah. songs, and we were like, whoa, this is kind of crazy you yeah, know how did you find us like how the hell did you yeah. even find us like in that era this is probably what mid 90s right yeah it was like uh so i guess it would be like 93 94 mm -hmm. wow and, and we would just go you know i mean luckily we had like a real crew around us you know you had obviously our brother's band but then you had the hoobastank guys that were like our best friends also and and you know even like a few of the guys that like ended up being in lincoln park they were in another a band that that uh ended up playing a backyard party in the singer of Hoobastank's uh, house wow. that we played. So there was like, there was just a lot of camaraderie. There was definitely like a scene, you know, of, of like a generational sort of scene. And you'd see like the, the younger musicians that were, you know, a few years younger than us coming to our show and being like really excited to talk about music and share their demos with us. And it was like, I don't know. I just think it was like, there was a really good foundation and we would play shows together and we basically would sort of cross pollinate our fan bases. And, and, and healthy competition, too, yeah. I feel like, too, because like, we, you know, in in growing up with all these bands and writing records and doing it and showing each other and still being friends, you're you're still trying to be like, shit, that's better. That's yeah. better than ours. We have to be better. We have to make ours better. Yeah. You know, like there's still that like you always always wanting to level up because you want to be better than your friends are. <laughs> but yeah, that was. Yeah. What were you going to say? Sorry. Oh, no, I said no. You, that was a, a perfect point. But I think it would just it allowed for us to have it. We didn't do it on our own. You know, like we were able to do it with like the help of of our friends that were also in bands, you know, and, and we all kind of came up and got record deals at the same time when you really think about it. <laughs> right. Yeah, the whole scene kind of exploded at the same time. It's really interesting, actually. A bunch of bands that were all very talented and, and ended up making a lot of noise <laughs> like all you yeah. guys did. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> that doesn't happen. Like one maybe makes it out, but yeah, all yeah. of you guys did. Yeah, it was funny. It's like no one. I mean, when was Calabasas on the map in terms of? of you know having like a musical scene and then all of a sudden it was like wow these come all these bands yeah. were coming out it's pretty cool and then the kardashians took it over yeah the kardashians and then you see them. <laughs> i was gonna say drake has a line about calabas and see yeah does he really oh, okay yeah <laughs> that's become the new like beverly hills uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah like the beverly hills valley yeah is that a praying mantis what is that where right here what is that it's a spider oh, okay never mind sorry there's a spider just chilling over here he's distracting me <laughs> spider. Yeah, i'm here. gonna take him out oh yeah don't you kill him. Don't you kill him. I don't kill I don't kill him, Tex. I know, yeah, we're recording, so don't don't kill him. Yeah. <laughs> don't let him out. See that? I put him outside, too. My wife was like, you don't kill that. That Bring, bring that outside. I'm like, it's 43 degrees out. It's not going to go well for him out there, either. <laughs> it's going to become a tiny little bottle. Yeah, that's, I, I think about that too much with, with too many, like, little insects and stuff. I can't kill anything anymore, because I'm just like, they don't. They're not trying to do anything. They're not right. trying to, you know, like annoy you or be make you scared. Like, yeah. little tiny things gonna make me scared. Anyways, yeah. When you guys are saying like you're just jamming in the garage, things are picking up. Where are you pulling from sound wise? Like, what are your influences? Because in my head, growing up, I always thought like bands when they started, they had a like a direct mantra for the band. This is what we want to sound like. And the more we've talked to bands, it's like the sound that that we that we ended up with. That's just what came out. It's just five dudes hanging out and that's the output. So I'm curious for you guys. I mean, I think, yeah, I think you're, you're a collection of all your influences, right? Yeah. Like yeah. all the, all the recipes that you've tried or listened to that you're like, Oh, I like that. I like that. I'm going to season this with that. And then you add, you know, your, your sort of uh, ingredients to it. I feel like a big thing for all of us was, was the scene from the nineties, like the, basically like the grunge scene, because up until then it's like, you know, I think we all went to school and our moms would play pop radio and you'd mm -hmm. hear Whitney Houston, Prince, Michael oh. Jackson, Madonna, I love Whitney. all amazing, <laughs> all amazing artists. Like, yeah, but, amazing. You know, I think that's probably why we like things that are hooky and sound catchy. And then we all went through like a metal stage, which I still love metal and you still love some metal. And, but then when, like, I think when we came like 11 to 13 years old and, for example, when Smells Like Teen Spirit came out, and I, I heard some podcasts where they were like, everybody remembers where they were when they heard Smells Like Teen Spirit. I don't know if like Billy Joe from Green Day said that, or uh, maybe it was uh, Fat Joe from, is it Fat Joe from No Effects? Is that the right name? Oh, no, Fat Mike. Yeah, Fat yeah, Joe. No effects, no fat Joe. Yeah. yeah, Fat Mike from No Effects to, I think. Morbidly obese Joe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, 
said like everybody knows where they were when that song came out and um and i remember i was i was 11 years old and i was at my friend zach's house and i heard that and it was just literally like just a light sort of flashed a light bulb kind of turned on and it was just like what the fuck is this and then after that was pearl jam and then you know, I, I mean, I knew about the Chili Peppers, but then, you know, I just, all these records, like Radio Allison Chains, out, right Radiohead, yeah. you know, it's like all these amazing, like, just earth shattering albums came out. And I think that's, that's what I remember, like, I was super impressed with Jason because Jason was singing the song Alive by Pearl Jam. <laughs> and I was like, wow, you sound kind of good, like Eddie Better. That's cool. And <laughs> nice. I was probably doing compression. Yeah. And, then, and those were a few songs that we covered, you know, like we played alive um, at like a few kids birthday parties that we were asked to yeah. we were hired to go play. And, and it started with that. And then I think we just kind of just started writing whatever came out to your point. It's just like whatever riff I thought of, we would play and Jason would sing whatever lyric mm -hmm. or melody he had in mind. And we didn't really overthink it. That happened later. Yeah. Definitely happened later. I'm sure. <laughs> at, at, at the same time, though, the funny thing is, is that we we went through so many different styles of music over like, I don't know, just like a five to ten year period. Yeah, we we were first we were like metal with spoken word and then doing some covers. And then we got into like ska and, and yeah. funk and punk. And uh, uh, again, like there were other bands that was also becoming popular at the time. So we we're thinking like, oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, it, it's whatever is kind that's of like lighting you at yeah. the time. Exactly. So we, and then we, I mean, we wrote a couple of, even, even as audio, but we wrote a couple of like songs that sound like they, we purposely wrote them so that they could be used in a Karate Kid movie. Like that was, that was the whole idea. Yes. Oh, I'm like, in. We need to write some like fight songs, like songs that feel like you can like do karate to and shit. And uh, Ari and Ari, I didn't like that though. So yeah. we yeah. didn't end up going with it. But um, yeah, we get lost sometimes. We were yeah. just like, it's we... too much fun to, it's too much fun to write. It's yeah. too much fun to create like vibes and, you know, and, like, so. Yeah, I mean, it's like, so you blend a lot of elements together, but there are certainly times where you're like, who, who it's like almost too schizophrenic, you yeah. know, like, and I think yeah. that's what we were for a long time, you know, like, as you mentioned, a lot of the grunge bands, and then, you know, from Rage Against the Machine came out, and then all of a sudden, it was like the Deftones, and we were like, we saw the Deftones, we saw Corn, and it was mm -hmm. like, holy shit, because it brought out that same sort of primal energy that all these bands that we fell in love with, yeah. uh, and and sometimes I feel like we'd pull a little bit too much from those ingredients, and we Wait, would because we loved it so much. Yeah. We were like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and sound like that. Yeah, and I think I think there uh, it just becomes a time where you're comfortable just as who you are and what you what you 100%. are is instead of like putting a mask on to be somebody else is whatever musician you are. If you're yeah, a singer singing like somebody else, you kind of can just now sing like yourself or play guitar like yourself. Well, that's what's amazing about it too, and that's what's been so fun. I mean, I. Both of us have been writing music outside of audio event for for a long time, but with these songs specifically because they're front of mind right now, it's just it, it's so cool to create these things and to to be surprised with uh, uh, not only the end result but where where it's going and just the writing process and stuff. Being like, oh shit, that's really cool, and then you can't get it out of your head. You like you become obsessed with this idea of like, oh, we gotta do that, we gotta do that. So that's these songs are coming out way better, I think, than we thought they they would, and we wrote them for the most part like what like two years ago yeah. basically oh wow yeah so it's i mean we've been we've been kind of working on them slowly for a little while we were a little better in the beginning about i think yeah. we had more of an idea and then just life just kind of gets in the way you know yeah no I, and uh you're talking sonic sunrise which just came out uh, a yeah. couple what geez three weeks ago almost a month ago now right around there uh, at time of recording and then um sleepless machine was what back last fall yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so long ago. uh you've got more coming i would assume hopefully yeah yeah, we've yeah. Nice. yeah we have uh we have one that's almost done jason actually just started some more mellow songs it's actually a, a piano driven song that uh uh jason did his first pass of vocals yesterday and then we're probably gonna finish it up tomorrow and then you know it's just it's about mixing for some reason sonic sunrise was like really impossible to mix for a a, a number of reasons like we're engineering it ourselves and we're producing it all ourselves. And, and, you know, with, with just our knowledge of how to mic things and how to make things, you know, instrumentation sound great. They're just people that are like really amazing engineers that can do that like quickly. So what we learned is when we brought in, um, this is acoustician friend of mine, um, and also a mix engineer, um, 
his name's Hush, really, really uh, talented. He came in to help us out and we had to re-record, you know, a lot of the instrumentation to really just to, to have the instrumentation feel a bit more rich and, and warm sounding. It was a bit cold sounding before. So that just took a really long time to get that done and then just get it mixed. There's a lot of elements in that track that I was like, if you have the good, the distortion guitar is too loud, then you don't hear the synths and the sort of atmospheric ethereal elements. Yeah. And then if you make those too loud, it's like the balance was really, really difficult. So we both what, love production too. Yeah. So we're, 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 you know, we have to be mindful of, we've learned this on the, on the last two anyways, when you're producing it, be mindful that you're not just putting all the ideas you have in your brain out, out there, because it's like, okay, you kind of have to kill some of your darlings. You know, you can't have yeah. everything. Some things are going to be better when they're just left on their own. You're going to be able to, feel the impact of what it is yeah. instead of this menagerie of stuff which i still love you know but it's a lot more digestible yeah in the long run you do it the other way yeah you and, and i think we anthony and i both love stuff like that too but you're right it can get lost on a lot of people if there's just so many things coming at you so it's like pull a couple things back save those for another spot yeah, yeah. That, that that certainly makes sense to us so i gotta ask just because i was looking it up today are there any papa's dojo cds still kicking around I think Paul has that. What he has multiples? I think he might have multiples. Oh, he did. He did. I think he showed me a picture of like a box him. of them or something. Because I was on Discogs today just to see if there was anybody selling them. Yeah. They're going for like twenty five to forty five bucks on Discogs. No way. <laughs> yeah, it was a Are couple you for sale. Going to be rich. There's your retirement, <laughs> gentlemen. No, just uh, just a heads up. If the, if you got one kicking around, it's yeah, it's twenty five dollar bill. Hey, <laughs> I know I have the Papa Roach demo CD. I know I have that and still nice. in the back. Oh, that's probably worth big bucks. Yeah, I'm so, sure. So context, Papa's Jojo was your was it the your first album? Or was yeah. that first full length we, we as a, band? We, 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 demo we just had demos. Yeah, we that was our tape, first so. that was our first um album, our first LP, which you know a, mo- a majority well, we can get into that later. Why so many of those songs uh ended up on Dirty Sexy Nights in Paris. But yeah, that was Papa's Jojo was really fun to make. We actually made it I think in like four days. It was really fast. You sang like eight songs in one day. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, oh, man. I don't remember any of it. Yeah. So things are popping off locally. There's people you don't know at shows. Yeah. At some point, are you shopping this to majors? Because you, you signed with Atlantic, and we've, we've learned just doing this. There's always a story, right? There's yeah. always a story of how you end up landing where you land, right? Yeah, so we we ended up getting some somebody at MCA Records, this guy Don Gaiman, who produced Hootie and the Blowfish, got our got our demo tape. It was called Hoog Music. And they reached out to us and we were just like, holy shit, MCA, like, you know, it's like it's literally like that thing you do, you know, like where you find out that a major label yeah. interested in you and all of a sudden it just validates every dream you had in your mm-hmm. in your mind. And he came to see us, and he hung out with us, and we were like, and he just had some like you know, basic ideas of, of things he, he would want to change about like one or two of the songs. And he was just a producer, but I guess he had, he had been involved with MCA. I don't remember if it was through a subsidiary or not, but so basically they wanted to do like a demo deal where it's like, we're gonna, I'm going to produce you. And then if we want to keep the album and, you know, sign you to MCA, then we get first right of refusal. And it gave them exclusivity to us for like a year or something. And we just weren't cool with that. We were like, you know, like, I'd rather, you know, I think, I think we probably ran it by, you know, like, I for sure ran it by my brother, who was always really great in terms of, I think they were already signed at that point. Oh, yeah, they were for sure signed at that yeah. point. And, and he was just like, no, like, just wait until like, you have people that are lots of people are interested in you, like, you don't need a producer trying to tell you what to do with your music at the moment. And so we just kept playing shows and we would see record label people just in the shows every time we play and people would come backstage and talk to us and be like, great show. Like, I'm just going to keep my eye on you guys. And then when we, when I remember we did Papa's Dojo, I was just in my, I was in my bedroom and I was playing that song Stalker. I don't know if you're familiar with that song. And, um, oh, yeah. and I, I remember my brother came into the room and he heard it and he was like, he was like, what's this? And I was like, Oh, it's our new song. He's like, Oh, this is awesome. I was like, he he's like I was you know really stoked that he he liked it and um and he was like dude I think we should we should get this song you know to some record label people I think you know people would be really interested in it so we went to this guy this other studio with this guy named Slam who I guess had toured with Three Eleven or something 
he Slam. um that's amazing yeah Slam. he mixed that's why on on papa's dojo there are a few songs that sound way different so remedy stalker and um i don't remember which other one we mixed but slam mixed them which they sound a little bit more hi-fi than some of the other songs on there and we sent that to interscope records they were going to give us some money to record new demos that didn't happen but through all of that process like rick rubin sent somebody to our house to pick up uh, a cd for for his wow. label and um were they wearing shoes he, it wasn't him no <laughs> it was, it was, yeah yeah no, i, I just wonder if he makes his minions wear shoes or not but it was <laughs> funny dude some guy just showed up knocking on our door like my parents house door and was like oh i you know i heard you guys are in this band like you know uh, rick rubin american wants to hear like what's going on with you guys and then all of a sudden, like people from Epic, Atlantic, it just, I think people just started talking and then caught wind that we were getting that attention. And before we knew it, we had a show to release Papa's Dojo. And that, even before we, that release, like three days before we met with Atlantic Records and they were like, yeah, we really are interested in signing you guys. We want to bring some people to your show. And then, um, so they came along with maybe like seven or eight other record labels. We did the show. We didn't hear immediately from them afterwards. But literally after that show, Interscope then called us one of the private a private um, showcase, a showcase yeah. which we did at the Viper Room, which is the, the really awkward shows where you know you're in front of like 13 people, they have a bunch of pizza and like cheese and crackers. <laughs> We've heard this Pre- stuff. Pretend yeah. there's a million people singing yeah. your song right now. Yeah, and okay. like, yeah, and then play four <laughs> songs basically. And we did that with like for them, Maverick Records, who you know had had uh, Deftones and. Maverick was actually great. They were really, really fun. And uh, it was funny because when we, we decided to go to Atlantic because they were the first ones to sort of fight. But I remember after we, we, we chose Atlantic Records, Guy Osiri, who was at um, Maverick called Happy Walters, it, it was at Immoral Records, was like, dude, they're, like, they're going to go like, get them to my house. And I remember we went to Guy Osiri's oh, yeah. house and he had Jamba Juice drinks for me and it almost got me to sign. Just because of Amazing. how delicious that beverage was. Didn't he have like a name written on it too? Yeah, or something? yeah. yeah. it was yeah. just like, and he was Real great. Personal. He was great. The only reason we we honestly didn't go with him is because he thought the single that we should use was totally different than what we thought. And we were like, no, this is it's not the right fit. We really liked him, but um, we ended up going to Atlantic. So that's the long-winded story. Oh, I love it. I love showing up to, so your, to your house. Like, you know, no phone call. And, you know, it was probably early days of email, but like, Imagine I applied for a job and my the prospective employer shows up at my house. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. But you're so stoked, you know. Yeah. They're just, they're just so stoked. Yeah. You're so stoked that somebody's interested in your band. I remember we gave them a CD and they're like, "Thanks," I'm like just took off. That's amazing, right? Yeah, because you could you're not emailing you know big files no. like that back then anyway. No. So no, we were still doing mailing lists, like paying. Yeah. You know, we go to oh, we yeah. go to back then Kinkos. It wasn't yeah. FedEx. And we would make friends with all the people. A lot of the people that worked like the graveyard shit were there bands. were in bands. Yeah. So we would get hooked up with like, you know, you make a bunch of flyers and then we would have to pay for stamps to send them out yeah. to our, our, you know, the people that signed our mailing list. But there was no email for us back then. So they would tell us like, come in after midnight. Like, cause yeah. that's, that's when I can do it. Cause that's when they do their stuff. Yeah. Too. Right. Yeah. 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 Can hook you up. <laughs> yeah. I remember they had a little key that would show you, you plug it into the, the Xerox machine. And it would show how many copies you had. And then you'd have to bring the key up. And so we learned a trick that if you just drop the key on the ground, it would just mix up all the numbers. <laughs> nice. Could, nice. Could, could, allegedly. Could, allegedly. Yeah, that allegedly. Yeah. I mean, we never did it. <laughs> you never we did it. No, we just heard stories. <laughs> we just heard, we heard stories. stories about how you could do that. When do you start recording? So you sign, how long from when you sign to record? Because, you know, as you alluded to, Dirty Sexy Nights is, the bulk of it is Papa's Dojo, mm-hmm. song-wise. Mm-hmm. So how does that, how does that happen? You want to answer? Well, we, I mean, we've written a lot of stuff. We went down like a wrong route. That yeah. It was like when we were like, we did like, we lost ourselves again. Yeah. You know? we, were, we were trying some new things, even though it's like, no, you formally got working. They got you signed. Like, yeah. go with that. Yeah. We started trying to, like, I don't know, go a different, go a little bit of a different direction. And like I was saying, like writing that fight song and stuff, like trying to. The metal spoken word channeling back to that. <laughs> well, that, that would have been something else. <laughs> yeah. <I'm> just, <laughs> I'm a fan of the spoken word metal stuff, but. Yeah, I don't know. I, I really, thankfully, your memory is a little better. Yeah, I think somewhere along the, the path, we, instead of doing, and this is what I was saying, overthinking and getting writer's block, like instead of doing what we did naturally and what we really liked intrinsically, we started 
going after trying to be something else. Like, let's sound yeah. like this man. And so there were like a younger thing to do. Yeah. yeah. And, and, that, and that followed us into Dirty Sexy Nights in Paris. And that's honestly the, the biggest reason why we weren't able to sort of replace all those songs and make a brand new album. And it's also ultimately the reason why we ended up imploding. Because, you know, Dirty Sexy Nights in Paris, we ended up getting a producer that we liked. We met with a bunch of different producers, uh, Gavin McKillop. And we liked him because he came in and like immediately was just like, let's try this. And he took all these risks that, you know, we're all super opinionated and that could have gone, you know, against him. And to his credit, he, you know, took a risk and, and you know, yeah, got yeah. us to go with him. And he yeah. wasn't the obvious choice. Like we met with Don Gilmore, who was going to, you know, he did the Linkin Park albums. I think the first two. Yeah. Michael Beinhorn. Um, Michael Beinhorn. Well, we were going to have we wanted Michael, Michael Beinhorn. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. That's the first person that we were going to go with. I forgot about that. Yeah. Wow, you forgot about something. Huh? Yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> that one stuck with me, though, because, I, I, you know. Yeah, and, you know, Michael Beinhorn produced, for those of people on your podcast who might not know who he is, he produced, like, the, the Soundgarden Super Unknown album and a bunch of... Chili Peppers. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah, and, um, and literally the day we were supposed to start with him, we went to a studio, and he was like, <laughs> listen, I just got asked to do the corn record. So if you can... You can wait five months, and we were like, no. So we ended up going with Gavin McKillop, who we also really, really liked. And it was cool to have somebody that like would get in the middle of us making bad decisions, you know, like, or, or yeah. yes. guy, what are you doing? You know? Um, Cause there were certain songs like, like for a song, like, like for example, looking down, we'd had forever and we would change that or a song like underwater silence that started from the song called numb. That was on, like, we were just regurgitating old ideas and trying to improve them. But then you had a song like the energy that was new. And for some reason we were able to get through that. And then the song rain, which also felt, obvious to us that it was it, it made sense and it, and it worked really well but to be honest i think you know our drummer and us jamin and us we, we just had different sort of conflicting points of view of what was right, right for the band yeah. which ultimately was why we went our separate ways um with him but uh i think it was just that's the real reason why we weren't able to just make an entirely new album it was just like Every time we would try, we would do something either wrong or like we couldn't all agree on what was really fitting. Well, we lost that that uh, that spark. That thankfully, that's why these songs, these new songs, have been so much fun because we're back to that first area yeah. that we were at where we're just like, let's just make stuff. Let's just yeah. It's almost a call back to the early days. Exactly. Yeah. And so, um, without thinking about like, oh, it needs to sound like this, it needs to sound like this, it needs to be as good as this, or as good as this. We're doing exactly what we know how to do, and thankfully, we've been informed by the other projects we've been in. We've been writing songs the whole time, so. We've gotten to a point where we're like, when we came back together, it was like, oh shit, this is actually really easy and really fun again. So yeah, love that, love that natural, natural spark. Well, and, and the benefit of time, maturity, yeah. all that too. You're like, okay, well, let's just do the things we want to do, the things we love. Let's yeah. not worry about all that other bullshit that I'm sure at the time you just signed to a major, you want to impress everybody. You want the world to know who you are. You're trying to make every right decision, but if you're not all on the same page, that becomes difficult. Yeah. yeah, and it is hard hearing hearing bit like the the label, the people that are paying for your record, and constantly reminding you the fact they're paying for everything, uh, even though you're paying for it. Yeah, <laughs> right. right. Ultimately, uh, yes. you have to hold it over your head, even though it's like, well, that's actually my hand that's over my head, not yours. And also, you yeah. know, the sort of the brotherhood challenges of basically yeah. being married to four different individuals. You know, like from what well, I guess we were from when we were fourteen to then getting signed in our early 20s, you know, you already had a lot of time together to bicker and fight and have, have you know, issues. And I just think once we got signed, those were already sort of coming to a head. And luckily, you know, we were able to make a record. And I think because we had that producer, he was able to help kind of like focus us a bit. Because I don't know if, if we were left to our own devices, I don't know if that would have actually come to fruition. Yeah. Like, honestly. But it still took a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Which is why when we went to go make a second record, the whole thing kind of just like. Yeah. We started getting back to that place of experimentation again. Yeah. We just lost our identity at that yeah. point mm -hmm. because we were so trying so hard to be like, OK, we can't, you know, Jamin just left the band. So we're like, OK, we're, we're taking the reins back ourselves. Let's yeah. let's start something brand new again. You know, we even thought about changing the band, name of the band. And uh, kind of starting over in a way, but we'd kind of lo we'd lost our identity at that point yeah. because we went so far like to the other in the other direction with trying to I don't know. We also started smoking a lot of weed too, you know, <laughs> which was like to a certain degree, it's like it, it opened up like it opened up 
the walls that were confining us in, mm -hmm. in certain ways. And we just were like, let's listen to like all these really cool classic albums, you know, these like really cerebral albums that we were now like, oh, well, let's be inspired by this. Let's not do the what audio sort of, did, yeah. yeah, the, the, like the rock stuff that we were doing in audio event. Let's kind of move away from that. And um, again, it was like a, it's like a, a loss of identity. Yeah. We're like, who the fuck are we? We have no idea. Yeah. I, I listened to those demos that we made and I'm, I'm like, this does not sound like <laughs> us at all. I, I like even forgot how to sing purposely. I just <laughs> was trying to just sing differently, sing as though, because I was listening to a lot of Neil Young and a lot of singers that were not great singers, but they were more great, just like, I don't know, uh, songwriters and, and uh, like, they were using more of their voice, more of their speaking voice, I guess you could say. So their voices weren't always like pretty or good. And so I kind of got that in my head that I don't need to sound good. You know, but your voice is pretty and good, man. You got to <laughs> But again, loss of identity. We didn't know that what, who the hell we were. So we were like, let's try this. Let's try that. Yeah. So. Well, what's interesting is I think a lot of music fans and more on the casual music fans of bands, they discount how hard it is to be in a band, the brotherhood aspect. Mm -hmm. And I can't help but think like the people that I would have been in a band with at age 13 are absolutely not the same people that I would have chosen to be in a band with at 24. And here you guys are, you made it work yeah, up, really up until then. Right. Yeah. 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 No, we definitely did. I mean, we had, you know, we had, a, we had, it was, it was, uh, it was pretty amazing. You know, if you, we, we when I look back, yeah. like what we got to do, you know, we got to have a number eight song on the billboard charts. We sold like over a hundred and, I think 145,000 albums uh, in the United States. We got to go tour in Europe. We got to play all the late night shows. Like we got to play, I mean, we got to live that dream, which was so fucking cool, you know? Like, and, and I have really fond memories of that. There's really stressful ones too. Cause when you have a record label being like, how many albums do you sell today? They're expecting us to not sell 150,000 uh, albums. They're looking to sell 3 million albums. Yeah. So to them, I'm sure it's like a, a huge like failure to them. But for us, we got to like, you know, live that dream that you see in movies. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And, and it, I mean, that piece of it is amazing. And I'm glad that you have that perspective because it could have been, you could look on those days terribly. You, you may not want to have this conversation with us about that stuff. So I'm happy that you guys are able to be, you know, look back at this stuff fondly because it, it makes me feel better. <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was a blast, man. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And like I said, I don't remember all of it, but I really only have like, really fun, positive memories from the whole experience. Nice. And just the fact that you go to a random place that you've never been in your life and you walk into like a TGI Fridays and the whole wait staff knows who you are and they're all talking. <laughs> That's to amazing. It's, it's yeah. like, we are in the middle of nowhere. How the hell do you people know who we are? Yeah. And then they show, come to show up at the show and they all know all the words to everything. And it's like, that's just the coolest thing when you can connect with people in, in this invisible way, you know what I mean? Through music, it's just, it's really, really cool. So you said you don't remember uh, anything. I'm curious. Do you remember Kilborn and Leno? Yeah. Those experiences? Because I, as, as like a, someone who views it on the other side, to me, it's like a seated audience. You got a bunch of lights on you and you got to perform. It must be, it must be difficult. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, you are keeping a little bit in the back of your mind that it's like, you know that when you watch things on TV, uh, the, the late shows, the band rarely sounds like, the way they want to sound, you know what I mean? And, but at that point, I feel like we were just kind of like little thrashers in our, in, in the way we were doing things. We were on tour the whole time we were doing those things. We'd fly back, fly to these different places to go. I don't know, it was just in LA, right? No, LA and New York. No, that was, well, yeah, we did the Carson Daly show in That's New York. Right. Okay. But yeah. in LA, we flew, we were on local bazooka tour. Yeah. And I remember they were in like Georgia. We were just left Georgia or something and flew to, to Kilbourne. And I, I remember like we had no sleep and I, 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 I had slept in like four days and was having panic attacks yeah. from not sleeping. Wow. And I, I remember they put it, they put me in a room and I fell asleep for like three hours. And we, I think you, you play really at like 4 PM, but they make it seem like, you know, oh, you're wow. Because yeah. they do this like cool panning effect that makes it look like Craig Gilborn's there while you're doing it, but he wasn't there while we were playing. Oh, wow. Inside yeah. baseball. I like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. He came <laughs> he was up. He was filming old school. Yeah, yeah, to yeah, totally. That's right. I forgot he was in old school. Yeah. What happened to Craig Kilborn? I have no, I have no <laughs> idea what happened. <laughs> no one knows. That's the name of this episode. What, what happened, happened to Craig Kilborn? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Sounds like a good documentary on Netflix or something. You guys should get him on your show. Yeah.
I, I know. absolutely yes yeah. yeah. there, there are some cool late night show, shows that did awesome i mean the stuff that we grew up with musically uh conan was one that had everybody yeah. that we listened to yeah. craig had a bunch of people uh, so and you guys getting to play those things is uh, it that's got to feel just in the moment you've made it because you've signed to the major and you're playing local bazooka and you're flying places to play late shows but I would imagine that, like, we're, we're here to do Leno. Like, that's fucking crazy. Yeah. Every, and, and we took our first time, well, not still my only time, but taking a private jet from, we were on tour, right? Yeah, from, on, from New York. From New York. From New yeah. York to L.A. And it's just like, we got to get on a plane, let's go. We get off stage, get on a plane. And it was just it's so cool. Every moment, you mentioned this earlier, but every moment of the journey of, like, the, the, all the different steps that we got to take, they were all just reinforcing that that dream that we all have. Like so, every time getting get on that plane, it was like, "Holy shit, we're here!" Just getting on stage and people singing back, "Holy shit, we're here!" Everything was that moment, and so that's really what I don't know. That's the most thing. That's the best thing I remember about it, is that it was just it constantly felt like you were just you were that you were in that dream for real, you know. In the newness of it, everything's so new, exactly. and it's a new experience, and. Yeah, I, I'm sure it's tough to soak it all in in the moment too, like to really so. appreciate yeah. it. I think it's like I think rear view mirror thinking. It's like looking back now, I'm able to really have that gratitude for mm -hmm. for that experience. I think when we were in it, I certainly was just like North Star. We're not there. We're not there yet. We're not there. Yeah. Okay. Jay Leno, that's part of the route, but we're still like we need to get to here. Yeah, and I I don't think at that time I had the wherewithal to be able to be like. Look how great this is. Like, I remember, appreciate everything. Yeah, I remember about. my guitar tech at the time was like, dude, you guys are going, like, you're doing this, like, Jack Daniels sponsored tour. That means that Jack Daniels, like, sees value in you guys. Like, you, and I was like, Jack what? himself. I was like, yeah, Jack, Jack, Jack himself. Jack. Jack Daniels. Yeah. It's not the drink, just Jack Daniels. Yeah. Just like this yeah. random guy. Right. But uh, uh, I remember I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Like, I, it's just like, my brain you have to have someone tell you yeah basically. i just yeah. I, I i didn't have that moment of being mindful and being like wow look at like let's let's just take a breath and like see, sit back yeah. like there was never any of that i don't i don't know that many kids can do that yeah anyway, so yeah they they can't you're absolutely right they and none of us could at that age that's just not how anybody's wired as people it's very rare you find somebody who's got the wisdom of you know 45 years old when they're exactly. 22 but you can't. that's also why that's also why child stars usually suck you know when they grow up yep. Yep. You know, yep they get they get this weird idea of what life is and they're not able to appreciate it so it's just normal to them. that's just okay this is what it is this is what it is yeah. and then they end up going off the deep end and everyone hates the guys yeah they're a piece of shit yeah yeah <laughs> i can't blame them totally but i just, you know <laughs> so i'm i'm the audio event story is it, it's kind of one of one really so the dirty sexy nights comes out you you're riding off this the second album I don't think we have time to really get into that story, but there's like a 15 year gap from like 03, 04 to like 2019. I know there was a Hoobastank, um, you know, type of reunion thing, but like, w were there talks of you guys in that 15 years? Like, let's get the band back together. Let's write. Like, was there any of that in that time frame? We, we talked about it. We got together. Like, there was one time with like Jamin and Paul and oh you. God. We went to Sound Arena, this old rehearsal space that we used to play. And we were like, let's just go play. And it was like, it was fine. It was like, I don't know. I don't think any of us walked away being like, let's go make a new album. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Jason and I had like some turmoil after our second record for, you know, just stupid bullshit reasons of probably both of us just being immature and needing to grow immature, up. Yeah. And then we became friends and slowly like just started talking. And, and what literally made this thing happen was was when I posted the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, MTV like episode or just one of the songs on Facebook, and it got this like overwhelming response on Facebook for us, where people were like, "Oh, you got to get back together." And and Dan Estrin from Hoobastank was like, "Dude, would you guys like open up for us on this North American tour?" And so I asked Jason. And Jason was like, "Yeah, let's totally do it." And talked to Paul. He was in. Jamin, unfortunately, he he just he wasn't able to do it, and um. And so we we asked our friend Shane, one of our good friends who I met, who was a fan of the band when he lived in Miami before I even became friends with him. I was like, do you want to play drums in, in audio? And he was like, fuck yeah. So we started practicing and it just became super fun. And then we started writing and and uh, and kind of one thing led to another. And Jason and I found this like sort of 
like we we resurfaced that excitement that we talked about yeah. earlier, that like childlike wonder and excitement about making the magic again together. Yeah. And it just felt a lot more uninhibited this time. Like it felt like we I think we both as adults have a much better understanding of who we are and and aren't constantly trying to figure that out anymore. Yeah. And we just let each other do our thing. Like we like I'll help him with production ideas he has and vice versa he does it with me too and it's just this super collaborative effort yeah and also uh we start we got back and start rehearsing for those for the shows we were going to do mm-hmm. and then who was saying can't that never didn't end, didn't end up happening yeah shows so then we booked our own shows yeah and we started rehearsing for those and we started re- reworking some of the old songs to like make them feel new again and uh we played those shows and it was so much fun we had the the two nights at the viper room both sold out nights it's like Holy shit! This still this still works. We can still get people to come out. Yeah, like um, even this, like even you asking us to do this, yeah. I'm like, wow, people cared about audio event. Like, yeah, yeah, man. As far as I was concerned, I was like, when we stopped playing, I was like, no well, one gave a everyone shit. Everyone forgot like, about us. We were just a flash <laughs> in a pan, and like, yeah. some people might like the song, but like when we when we put the Viper Room show on, I'm like, maybe there will be 20 people, and like half of them will be our friends, and maybe a couple people that may have liked the band will come out, and it sold out in a week, like the first one, and people started writing us nice. on Instagram on Facebook. Saying like I'm flying in from London, so are you for sure gonna do the show? Like, wow. like people flew out from Ohio and in the East Coast and and just from all over the place, and we're showing us these pictures of us with them. Some we remembered, some I uh, you know might not remember. And like we're <laughs> yeah. asking for our autographs, and I'm like I'm like this like forty something year old dad. Like you want me to sign something for you? <laughs> like it felt, I was like, all right, you know. It was just it was wild because it was like getting put back into a time capsule. Yeah. And then bringing their and bring them bringing their kids too. Yeah. Also, that was really cool. Like, their kids are also into the band. I've, the, the the amount of times I've gotten these like Facebook messages from dads who are sending me a video of their kid like singing along with the song. Kids like five years old. It's his favorite song. Yeah. yeah. He's just <laughs> and, I'm, and then he sends me a message. Can you can you uh, uh, send us a message on his birthday? Because he's gonna be he's gonna freak out. Why does he? Why does he care? This is so long ago. It's so he can care about anything in the world, yeah. but yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. So. Just love that. Well, that that's your stuff struck a chord with people, man. I mean, that's yeah. that's awesome. That's I'm I'm very I'm excited listening to you guys talk about it. It's not even my, I didn't even create any of it. You know what I mean? Like, it's just <laughs> nothing to do with it. Cool stuff, man. I love to hear the story. So this is yeah. what gets this is the stuff that Anthony and I love. So yeah, yeah cool. that's, that's so a uh, new song. Sonic Sunrise just came out a couple weeks back. Really, that, that song is awesome. I listened to it in the car again today on the way to and from work. Just nice. to get a you know f- you know breathe it in a little bit and yeah. man this song is awesome I'm excited that that's that's some good stuff if this is the direction you guys are going this is gonna people are gonna be really happy ah yeah. thanks yeah we we're just we're just kind of making it I wish it didn't take so long to make everything happen it's just life and you know family and work and all the stuff that gets in the way of us tracking and recording I think we just have to make just more con con uh, what's the word I'm looking for uh, a concerted effort. Concerted effort. Yeah. Not conceited. No, you can make a conceited effort. You can make a conceited effort, but no, I don't like that. Right. But, but no, it's just, it's just finding the time to do it. And, and you know, right now we have, it's, it's, it's not too different from the past, but like we have like these seven songs that we're really proud of, two you've heard. Um, we have one that's almost finished. And then we have, you know, a few others that we just need to record. And I'm hoping they come out sooner than later because it's really fun to release it and like get people's yeah. feedback, positive or negative. You know, it's uh, it's like, most of it's been really positive and yeah. and um and it's it's fun it's fun to uh, hear and see. Yeah, I only got one I don't think we even talked about this. One one uh comment that I thought was really funny. The fuck is this Christian music bullshit or something like that? What? I was so fun <laughs> to write, write back because neither was a really religious, but it's just so funny to, I really want to write back like a go with God. <laughs> you, <laughs> you, know? Know? you should have. Yeah, yeah. No, but you can't engage with yeah, no. can't engage with there's always gonna be haters, you know, like that just that, that, and it's just there's nothing you can do not everyone's gonna like you and that's and that's fine yeah yeah you know they figure with the baddest yeah but. but these it's funny these songs you know when we wrote the bulk of them about two years ago it was it came after i came out of a breakup essentially and so i had a notebook full of just like i, I remember call, calling ben i think it was like the day after it happened or maybe even the day after day it happened. i don't know and i'm like dude we were talking about getting together and ranking a record now's the time to do it yeah, because I got this like really sad fire in my belly that we have to we have to like I have to get out, and it's amazing. It's like the first time that uh, 
and I we wouldn't have been able to do this unless Ben unless Ben asked me like, can I just look in your notebooks? Yeah, and it's so awesome to trust someone like so just thoroughly that you're like, okay. And that's like the most private shit. That's like the stuff that I'm I'm writing, not expecting mm-hmm. any. Yeah, that's a peek just, inside. Yeah, exactly. So the fact that I just brought in my notebooks and then I would sit there and be like, well, that's cool. Let's put that with that. Let's put that with that. Yeah. And it was like building this awesome puzzle with really raw emotions. And yeah, because it used yeah. to be it used to be like when we would write songs, not at the beginning, but um, you know, Jamin was very hooky in his in his you know musical taste and. Yeah. And um, and really talented at, at being able to make things sound hooky and got very much involved in helping with melodies and, and parts. And when we were doing um, Audio Event 36 Nights in Paris and uh, in Papa's Dojo as well. But, you know, the way that that we would typically write is you just sort of hum something or sing something with fake lyrics and then you'd make it work almost like working with cinder blocks, like like a nursery rhyme where you're like, da, 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 like, you know, da, 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 da. Right. And what I sort of discovered along the way over the last, I guess, 10 years is is it's really fun to work with just lyrics and 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 making the melodies more elastic when you put in different words that wouldn't necessarily go in that cinder block rhyme scheme. And so when Jason had all these lyrics, I was like, I was like, and we were trying to, and he'd have, we'd have these melodies where we'd both be singing things and we're like, this melody sounds awesome. And we'd be trying to find words that fit within those melodies. And I was like, well, why would you do that? Like 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 reverse engineer it and it's like do the words really mean anything to us like yeah they sound cool but do they mean anything and so he gave me his notebook i'm like well, what about this fucking line this yeah. line's super cool and like, it's not it's not even something that i would have thought before because i'm i'm so melody driven and and the uh the the i don't know the the sound of things coming out of your mouth like that really matters to me and everything so for me personally just as an insecurity i there were certain things i just like that's not singable that's just not singable I can't picture that coming out of my mouth. When I sing it, it doesn't work. But it's also because I was just, I was almost trapping it behind a wall. He was just like, just let's try this. Let's try this. Yeah. And ended up making things that were, I stre- it stretched my mind. It was, you know, really, really beneficial. Yeah, I mean, if you listen to the verses of like Sonic Sunrise, they're very much like free flowing. There's, there's nothing that's like, it's not confined melody, which there's nothing wrong with confined melodies. But uh, no, it's, I mean, that works sometimes too, but it's, you know. I still, when I write melodies, I still sing gibberish usually, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. but I do, since he and I have been working together, I, I found a, another pathway, which I appreciate more because then, I mean, because I write nonstop. So it's like, oh, there's a reason like, there's not have this stuff. I can use everything. Whereas before I was keeping this stuff private and then just going, okay, what's the random shit that it's coming out of my brain? Yeah. So, well, it's just freeing, you know, yeah. you, you're not, there's, there's no deadline. There's no suits saying I need a single. There's no, Hey. You know, throw a DJ in there, you know, throw, oh, God, wear yeah. masks, you know, it's just, yeah. just you guys. And like, when I hear, when I heard Sonic Sunrise, the first thing I thought of was, this would be great in the sphere, the Vegas sphere. It's just oh, a huge song. I didn't even think about that, And man. just put visuals to it. It'd be stunning. Oh, man. Yes, make it happen. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, good luck we'll tell that. everybody, but I, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah. I'm like, Anthony said it yeah. first. Let's no, when it. I close my eyes, I just... I don't know. That's where I went, and I haven't been there. I'd love to get out there, but it's really cool. Yeah. I saw you two there, and it was phenomenal. That's awesome. Damn. Yeah, and they've nice. got another thing coming too. I saw on the internet today another like show, a virtual show there. So it's wild. This is like being in a gigantic Oculus, you know? Yeah, that's cool. You're in like you're in another alternate reality, which mm-hmm. is great. Well, I'm excited for all of this stuff because it sounds like you guys are pretty happy about it and and we know what we've heard so far is awesome so ah. i'm really really cool to to hear you guys's passion about it man i i've, I've had a permagrin the whole night <laughs> right on man well you know we're we're excited that you're you're passionate about what we're doing and you know we're 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 just looking forward to putting more more of the music out and you know seeing seeing if people like it yeah you know? But ultimately, it's like we're just doing it now. To your point, it's like we're not doing it for suits. We're not doing it to try to, to like you know, be rock stars like we were when we were twenty three. I mean, that wasn't the only reason we loved doing it. it. Was it was you know in in all of our souls that we wanted to do it. But we don't have that that pressure anymore. You know, it's all it's all self inflicted pressure now. Yeah. If we do want to put it out as quick as possible, but we just do it for the passion of it now, and it's it's been. Uh, a labor of love. I just want to, I want it to be faster. And I know yeah. Jason definitely wants it to be faster. 
I'm the slower one that probably like slows it down. You know, it's okay. You have the good memory. So yeah, it's fine. We balance each other. Hey, your memory actually was pretty good. Oh yeah. So that's right. Tony and Anthony. Couple You've times. answered a lot of good. Questions. Yeah, not bad at all, man. I get no complaints here. <laughs> all right, good. I'd love it if you did. <laughs> hey, are we are we down for one last one last fun question? Sure. How fun was the looking down music video to make? Uh, it was a lot of fun. I mean, my main memory goes to the fact that I had uh, I was sick that day, oh, and wow. you know when um, I never like to lip sync in the videos. I usually lose my voice in the videos because I'm really singing. And I was already sick, and I think I screamed myself hoarse or yelled myself hoarse. So I was coughing throughout, like in between all the takes. There'd be like a, and then they'd have to cut because I'd have to cough. <laughs> So when you watch that, remember that now. Yeah. Almost every time I'm opening my mouth, they have to right in the cut. I had to cough. Yeah, so I, I did something really weird too. I remember we were playing. I don't remember what happened, but somehow I hit my my arm oh, yeah. on my guitar in a really weird way, and my whole forearm swelled up. And <laughs> well, it was keep an really eye out painful. in the video for that. Yeah, I'll look yeah. Just take a look. And it was like it hurt me the whole day, but I was like. Fuck it, but I thought it looked cool. It was cool. The visuals were cool. That the, the trippy, like he was like a Woodstock. Dude. Yeah, there was a guy that came out. He looked like he, he was did like, all the artwork behind us essentially on a projector. Yeah, he was at he, he was at Woodstock and yeah. like came up with that. Like I don't know if he invented it, wow. but he did that whole projector with like the the, the like, oils stuff, and stuff. Yeah, which was really cool. Yeah, yeah, that one that one was fun. We played it. At, we did that at the Mayan Theater. Yeah, downtown LA. And it's really funny because I don't know. I'm sure you've seen you know when bands do the slow motion type stuff where they shoot it twice as fast. We had to do that there. So it was literally like -na 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 -na. every every uh, shot is <laughs> that wow. you see in sort of slow motion must look ridiculous if you saw the yeah. actual version of it. We we have the footage. Yeah, and we're, and we're, we we're releasing it with this episode. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we actually just did that for the for the Sonic yeah, Sunrise video too. Not as fast. Yeah, not as fast. Uh, yeah, but we still did it faster, and it was actually really fun. Yeah, like we, I, I kind of was kind of surprised at the fact that we still were able to play the song. Yeah, I say we couldn't really hear me because the mic was not, but. So. Yeah, it was a blast. And Sonic Sunrise, we got to use live, you know, like us making the, you know, there was mm -hmm. stuff that we did post recording it, but, you know, a lot of the scenes in that video are, are us recording it in my studio in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Well, I think we, we could go more, but we'll save it for round two because there'll be, there'll be a round two if you guys are down for it. <laughs> Absolutely, man. <laughs> more songs we got coming out. Absolutely. It was just fun to talk to, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. But yeah. Excited for uh, what's coming down the line for audio event for you guys, and we really appreciate talking with you guys tonight. Yeah, Thank you. appreciate you, too. you guys. Pleasure to meet you. This was fun, guys. Thank yeah. you. All right, Thank cheers. You. Have a good night. Thank you for listening to Patio Slave. We are at Patio Slave on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all of the places that you can find us on social media. Facebook, Patio Slave Podcast. YouTube, Patio Slave Podcast there. Email us at patioslavepodcast at gmail.com. And hey, if you want to become a supporter, click on the link at the bottom of the episode and give us a dollar, give us five bucks. It keeps the lights on, keeps us going. We really appreciate that stuff. Thank you. You guys know Bull Moose Music, independent like uh, record store? Portland, Maine. In the Northeast. They used to always have a bunch of freebie stuff. So when I was like 16, 17, I would, we'd load up. You'd leave more from, you know, leave with more free shit than you bought. Although uh -huh. I did buy Dirty Nights. I'll, I'll say that. Yes. Cool. Same. same. Uh, thank you. But no, they had a, it was a big garbage pail. Anthony and I would, would skip fourth block of, uh, of study hall and, and drive to the record store and try to get free shit and then buy a CD every now and then. So until till this car got towed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> were, were, were those in the bin like put there by the labels like it was like a sampler yeah, yeah it was like of? a monitor this all okay, that type so of it stuff it wasn't like we can't sell these <laughs> no no they weren't for sale Please yeah they take were one. yeah <laughs> prom like radio not radio promo but like record store promo type type stuff so yeah they, they spent some money back in the day right i mean geez yeah, they did